Welcome. This is an introduction to health behaviour. In this presentation, you should learn definitions and theories behind the key concepts and models of behavioural change, among a bit more. Familiarising yourself with the content in this video should give you a pretty good understanding of the fundamentals of health behaviour and the role it plays in improving health. But first, what is health behaviour? Well, there are many definitions of health behaviour, but health behaviour could be generally defined as any activity undertaken for the purpose of preventing or detecting disease or for improving health and well-being. And in the handbook of health, they are defined as behaviour patterns, actions and habits that relate to health maintenance, to health restoration and health improvement. This was why the 1948 World Health Organisation definition of health was considered groundbreaking at the time and hasn't been amended since. It was considered an all-encompassing definition that had breadth and vision which wasn't merely the absence of disease. Locus of control and self-efficacy. These two terms are commonly used in health behaviour. They are self-limiting constructs which play a significant role in the likelihood of behavioural change. Locus of control and self-efficacy are distinctly different from each other although there is a degree of overlap between the two. Locus of control refers to the beliefs about the power we have over our lives. The locus of control is the place or location of where we believe the control over our life exists. For example, person A and person B both commit the same crimes and both get the same sentences. However, person A has an internal locus of control and person B has an external locus of control. Since person A has a strong internal locus of control, person A takes responsibility for his actions and admits it was the severity and nature of what he did that led to the prison sentence. However, person B has a strong external locus of control, so this person denies responsibility for his actions and blames the consequences on an overzealous judge or a poor legal team for his sentence. Person A with an internal locus of control sees his life in his own hands and only he can change his future. He is possibly highly driven and is in the driving seat of his life. He educates himself and plans for a successful career in the knowledge that he is the author of his own book. On the other hand, while person B with an external locus of control feels nothing is within his control and he screams helplessly in the passenger seat of a car he thinks he's being driven by fate. He sees himself as a victim of misfortune so he spends his whole life wallowing in self-pity, blaming the powers that be for the way his life has turned out, shaking his fist at the sky, screaming why me, whilst making no attempt to change his path in life because he truly believes it's out of his control. Person A who gets a £500 fine after throwing his helmet into the window of a car that knocked him off his motorbike will accept responsibility for his quick-tempered reaction and will admit the consequences are a result of him losing his temper. Whereas person B in the same situation would deny responsibility and say if it wasn't for the driver knocking him off his bike he wouldn't have got mad in the first place. He would also likely believe the driver's actions are the direct cause of his actions so his episode of Hulk smash was not his fault. Or he may say, if my useless wife had made the cup of coffee in the morning like she's supposed to, then I would have been less stressed and probably would have left five minutes later and avoided the whole incident. Yep, this is definitely your fault and it's only fair we split the fine. Okay, so these examples are a bit strange, but you get the point. Early research on locus of control by McDonald showed that among single female college students, nearly twice the percentage of internals reported practicing contraception than externals did. Rutter also theorised that having a strong internal locus of control was associated with a motivation to succeed and those individuals had better health outcomes later on in life. Whilst having a strong external locus of control is more likely among single parent families with low socioeconomic status and could lead to learned helplessness, depression and poor academic achievements. However, the good news is research does support the idea that a locus of control is learned and can be modified. Just remember, it's our attitudes that determine whether or not we make our own path in life. Self-efficacy The conviction that one can successfully execute the behaviour required to produce the outcomes. In other words, it is the belief in one's own ability to complete tasks or achieve goals. Example I am not confident in my ability to commit to a 6am run because I do not feel I have the will to get up at that time. I also feel that extra sleep is more beneficial to me than getting less sleep just to run. I never go to bed early either because I'm always up late studying, and getting up at 6am is just not something I'm used to doing. Therefore, my self-efficacy to complete that task is low. 
My efficacy to run at 11am, however, is much higher. By that time, I would be up, refreshed, had my cup of coffee and confident I can and will go running at 11am. I have also run at that time many times before and don't doubt my ability to do so again. Unless it was leg day the day before, then my self-efficacy takes a nosedive. Anyway, increasing self-efficacy can be achieved by tracing the sources of it. There are four main sources of self-efficacy. Number one, the most important and reliable source of self-efficacy is mastery of experience. Your successes and achievements are key for building self-efficacy. Conversely, your failure and shortfalls can decrease it. This may explain why someone's self-efficacy to go running at 6am might be low, because they have not built up enough successful experiences of completing that task at that time, and any unsuccessful experiences like planning to get up or going back to bed instead can decrease it further. Number 2. Vicarious experience. Observing a peer succeed at a task can build self-efficacy, while the opposite is also true. We often contrast ourselves against our peers and use our peers as a point of reference in an attempt to measure ourselves. The phrase, anything you can do, I can do better, is a classic but slightly extreme example of vicarious experience in which someone believes they can complete a task just because a peer can. This is why doing things as a group can encourage people to commit to behaviours they wouldn't usually commit to on their own. Number 3. Verbal persuasion. Social persuasion, credible communication, verbal encouragement or motivation can boost self-efficacy, as can altering physiological states such as emotional arousal and boosting one's moods. If you are trying to encourage a client to stick to a diet, verbal encouragement through simple phrases like don't give up, stay strong, exercise willpower and stay focused are simple ways to potentially increase self-efficacy. Or you could play on their emotions and alter their physiological state by saying, think of how good you'll feel when you've got the body you've worked so hard for. This is an appeal to someone's emotions by using cues to trigger them. Also, if we're in a miserable or gloomy mood, the belief we have in our ability to complete any given task will be much lower. Therefore, you can also increase someone's self-efficacy by boosting someone's positive mood state. The stronger the perceived self-efficacy, the higher the goal aspirations people adopt and the firmer the commitment is to them. For example, the higher a person's self-efficacy, the more ambitious that person is likely to be in the pursuit of job roles. Just remember, self-efficacy mediates the influence of motivations on behaviour. If the behaviour is deemed impossible, it will not be undertaken even if the person is motivated to do that behaviour. Now let's take a look at some of the key models in behavioural change. The health belief model, the theory of reasoned action, the theory of planned behaviour and the trans-theoretical model. The health belief model is a health specific cognition model that construes behaviour as a decision making process and assumes behaviour to involve planning ahead based on outcome expectations where many factors contribute to behavioural change. For people to adopt recommended physical activity behaviours, their perceived threat of disease and its severity and benefits of action must outweigh their perceived barriers to action. The health belief model has been most frequently used in healthcare settings to increase the uptake of healthcare services such as increasing acceptance of immunisation and compliance with medical treatment. The theory of reasoned action and the theory of planned behaviour share similar identical attitudinal and social norm related components. Both are structured at higher levels of generalisation which can be applied outside the health context. In addition, the theory of planned behaviour contains constructs related to control related beliefs and self-efficacy. The theory of reasoned action is proposed on the basis that our beliefs and evaluation of behavioural outcomes determine our attitudes to that behaviour. The theory of reasoned action then bridges the gap between attitudes and behavioural outcomes by inserting the construct of intentions. Intentions are determined by two factors, attitudes towards the behaviours and beliefs regarding other people's support of the behaviour. For behaviours that are within a person's control, the theory of reasoned action proposes that intentions predicts behaviour. The theory of planned behaviour. It is differentiated from the fear of reason actions by its additional dimension of perceived behavioural control. It's been suggested that the additional constructs contained in the fear of planned behaviour allow it to predict a greater percentage of overall behavioural variance than the health belief model and the theory of reason action. People's perceived control over the opportunities, resources and skills needed to perform a behaviour affect behavioural intentions, as do the two factors in the fear of reason action. The most key areas the theory of reason action and the theory of planned behaviour models have been applied to are exercise intentions and behaviours, weight gain prevention and eating behaviour, addiction related behaviours such as smoking and alcohol abuse, and HIV prevention and condom use. 
The trans theoretical model, Stages of Change, was created following research into smoking cessation and when adopting healthy behaviours such as regular physical activity or eliminating unhealthy ones such as watching too much television, this model states that people progress for five levels of change depending on their readiness. The five stages are pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action and maintenance. Each stage has different intervention strategies that will help people progress to the next stage, although this model also considers that people can enter or exit and relapse at any stage. In areas such as dietary change, the application of stage of change based models, such as the trans theoretical model, may have advantages over alternative approaches. Criticisms of this model are that people rarely progress from one stage to another without reversal. The time periods used to classify a person's stage of change are considered by some to be arbitrary and there is little evidence to support the idea that stage matched interventions are effective. Now let's look at addictions and the role health behaviour models play in intervention strategies against addiction. But first, let's look at the evolution of addiction as a disease concept. Our understanding and rationale of addictions and addictive behaviour has come a long way since the first model of addiction. The moral model, which originated in the 17th century, proposed that an addiction can be entirely blamed on the person's weaknesses or lack of morality in their character and proposes that the individual should be punished. As you can imagine, without the advancements in science we have today, the model was massively flawed, as you might expect in explaining or treating addictions due to its one-way approach, which didn't give any rise to biological or physiological basis for addiction. The first disease concept model began with a prohibition movement in the 19th century and had moved along somewhat but identified the substance itself as the problem and assumed that the individual was not to blame, further postulating the substance should be banned but the individual does not need help. The second disease concept then acknowledges that the individual has the problem but the substance can be legalised and the individual should be helped. The social learning theory has been used in the context of addictions but its use originated in the general context of how humans learn behaviours from each other. The discovery of mirror neurons may also provide the support for the basis of why we imitate others. Mirror neurons are a term given to neurons in the brain that are active when we engage in a behaviour, but also when we observe that same behaviour being carried out by another. The social learning theory asserts that behaviour is learnt by observing others, that addictions can be a result of learned behaviour, and that learned behaviour can be unlearned. Types of addiction Now let's look at types of addiction. Addiction is characterised by many factors that highlight the dysfunctional and destructive nature of addiction. The term addiction is used to describe compulsive, self-destructive behaviours where the pleasure reward system is repeatedly stimulated until a dependency on the reward occurs. Addiction is both behavioural and psychological, but there are two main distinctions, behavioural addiction and chemical addiction. Genetics account for about half the likelihood of developing an addiction, while environmental factors interact with a person's biology and affect the extent of genetic influence. However, anyone can fall subject to the underlying mechanism that causes addictions, as all types of addictions work on the same physiological basis. The term physical and psychological dependence, however, are somewhat redundant, as both types of dependence are mediated by neural mechanisms. Located deep within the brain is the limbic system, which serves as the brain's reward circuit. The limbic system is suggested to be a much older part of the brain's evolutionary anatomy, all of which are large physiological driving forces of addiction that control our emotional and behavioural responses. Okay. It's comprised of the hippocampus, the amygdala, the striatum, the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens. These deeper structures of the brain were defined by Paul McLean as the reptilian, the paleomammalian and the neomammalian limbic system. When this area of the brain is stimulated by a drug or a behaviour, the activation of cells causes an electrical signal which causes neurons to release molecules of neurotransmitters to the opposing neurons next to it. When a neuron sends an electrical impulse like this, it's called an action potential. This nerve impulse sends a surge of dopamine from one presynaptic neuron across the synapse to the postsynaptic neuron. When dopamine binds to the receiving cell, the chemical signal continues, triggering the pleasure sensation. Cross addiction, cross behaviour perspective. According to the disease models of addiction, each behaviour is examined separately. Therefore, an addiction to cigarettes is seen as a separate and different addiction to alcohol. However, cross addiction perspectives examine similarities and associations between separate addictions or behaviours. In the case of substance addiction, a medication or another drug or behaviour can stimulate the same receptor sites in a person's brain that regulates addiction and addictive behaviour. So if a person who has an addiction is given another addictive drug, the individual with the addiction may relapse into the drug of choice through the stimulation of the same mechanisms underpinning their original addiction. 
This same concept in cross addiction highlights the fact that one might assume they are no longer an addict and are free from addictive drugs or behaviours, but have become unknowingly addicted to other drugs or behaviours. For example, an alcoholic may unknowingly drink excessive amounts of coffee as a replacement for drinking alcohol. They might even habitually drink it at the same time they did the alcohol, but in a way, the addiction itself may still be present, but is being satisfied through other means. This concept can of course be a good or a bad thing, but channeling an addictive behaviour into something more positive is of course better than having an addictive behaviour for something much more negative. Smoking. Very few people start smoking regularly after the age of 19 and 20, and many children try their first cigarette whilst at primary school. Those who started smoking in childhood have an increased chance of lung cancer compared to those who started smoking at a later age. The main factor that predicts smoking is parental smoking, with reports that children are twice as likely to smoke if their parents smoke. In addition, parents' attitudes towards smoking also influences their offspring's behaviour. For example, if a child perceives the parents as being strongly against smoking, he or she is up to seven times less likely to be a smoker. Let's finish up with a quick overview of some potential interventions or some that are already in use for smoking and obesity, starting with the stages of change model. It's important to remember this model has been useful and it's frequently used against smoking, and an idea of how it's used in this context might look like this. But let's look at one more example of how this model could be used using the same principles but for promoting exercise instead. The transtheoretical model provides a good framework for behaviour change but has many critiques and drawbacks for its use in promoting complex health behaviours. The Nudge Theory Ever walked in a shop and came out with things you never intended to buy? Well, unless you were shopping with your girlfriend at the time, you've probably been subjected to the nudge theory. A nudge, as we will use the term, is any aspect of the choice architecture that alters people's behaviour in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentives. When you walk into a supermarket and your children scream at you for their favourite cereal because the characters on the front of the box are at your child's eye level, that's the nudge theory. When you've spent 30 minutes rushing around the supermarket, hungry and exhausted, waiting at the checkout with promotional chocolate displayed right in front of your eyes, screaming at you to buy it because if you don't, the next person will, that's the nudge theory. When your girlfriend tells you she doesn't want kids, isn't looking to settle down and thinks she might stay at mum's for a week, that's the nudge theory. Well, maybe, or maybe not. The nudge theory can have the effect of a seductress standing in front of you covered in chocolate saying, go on, treat yourself, have something naughty for lunch, plus I'm way cheaper than all that other boring healthy stuff. At the risk of sounding unscientific, you can view the nudge theory as something that can be used to entice your good or bad conscience, nudging you to make unhealthy choices or healthy ones. It's essentially a very subtle but powerful form of encouragement with specific directives. The nudge theory has been particularly effective when emphasising social norms. When a message states that normal people pay the taxes on time, people actually start to conform and pay the taxes on time, behaving according to these supposed norms, even if they're not true. The nudge theory has been used heavily to encourage the sales of junk food, but can also be used for good, if the powers that be stop being so sinister. Take a look at some of the common examples of intervention techniques including nudge examples and how they might be used to encourage healthy food choices. As you can see, the nudge theory is a very effective tool for encouraging choices about coercive tactics. The Prime Theory The Prime Theory is predicated on the system of human motivation and its five components are plans, responses, impulses, motivation and evaluation. The prime theory is based on the assumption that in order to understand human motivation, we need to understand the different levels at which that motivation operates from its most basic responses to its most complex levels of planning. The prime theory makes a good attempt at doing this and lays out the framework for this understanding using as little concepts as possible using everyday language as well as the fact it's also biologically plausible. It focuses on what energises and directs behaviour. For simplicity's sake, there are three central ideas to this theory. One, it's our wants and needs at each moment that drives our behaviour. Two, our intentions and beliefs about what is good or bad only influences our actions if they create sufficiently strong wants and needs at the relevant moment. And three, our image about ourselves and how we feel about our identity is a potentially very strong source of wants and needs which can be enough to overcome ones arising from biological drives such as hunger. Basically, the intention to do something won't always predict behaviour unless accompanied by evidence of wanting or needing to do something. For example, 40% of smokers in England say they ought to stop smoking, while 29% say they want to. Only those who say they want to are more likely to go on to quit in the following three to six months, or at least make an attempt at quitting. However, research has also shown that smokers who merely report they intend to stop smoking soon are more likely to make a quit attempt in the next three to six months, even when they do not report wanting to. 
So the take home message here is that wants and intentions are big motivators and predictors of behavior. Well, that'll do you for now, which brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank God we got there in the end. Here, I'll leave you with a key list of terms in health behavior with the references used included in the end. I hope you found this video interesting and educational. It's amazing how long 20 minutes of a video takes to make. So, to help with the production and continuation of these videos, a small donation of no less than £100 should cover some of the resources required. Or, alternatively, you could just like and subscribe, which would be equally compensating. Thanks. Arrivederla.